people are hiring coaches and they're paying for these coaches and these coaches are not able to help them. If you're a leader in an organization, I always say you have skin in the game. A coach doesn't. You need to come up with solutions that are valuable, usable, feasible, and viable. We want people to think. Most founders gravitate towards the risk that they really are comfortable with. CEO needs to be actively involved. CEO needs to be committed to this. CEO needs to demonstrate to everyone, hey, we are doing this and there's no way around it. Their culture is all about, in fact, it's a culture of experimentation. You have to deliver results. I see lots of products that I love and lots of products that I hate all the time. The difference between the best and the rest is for a team, it's usually education. Agile coaches, most of them that I know, they don't have product management management experience and they don't have product designer experience. They try to coach the in product discovery and they have no idea. Welcome everyone to our next Agile Insights conversation. I am uh, today being joined again by Marty Kagan, whom I'd interviewed first time last year in November of 2021. Now we have our one year anniversary, Marty. Great to have you back. On, uh, on the show. I was very excited. We had to postpone this interview once, but uh, I'm glad that we can make it happen in, in this year. So welcome, uh, Marty, and you're joining us today from Colorado, right? Thanks. Thanks for inviting me back. Yeah, you can always be back. <laughs> thanks for taking the time to, to do this with us today. In our last conversation, we talked about product leadership and empower teams based on the book you had written or you ha you wrote Empowered, which is right behind you. Um, in today's conversation, I want to talk about products shortly, but then focus the main part of our conversation on the topic of transformation. And the reason it might be very selfish is when I work with organizations, mainly in Europe, even there, mainly in Germany, I see too many uh, senior uh, people not knowing what's actually in front of them when they decide to, to make that organizational transformation. And as part of that, obviously, leadership play, plays a huge role. And I know you've given some talks on that. I know you have a lot of experience in that space. And I'd like to spend the vast majority of the 60 minutes or some uh, around that that I'll get on, on exploring this topic with you. So thank you for, for taking the time. But in order to have an easy start, um, what was your first product, Marty? Oh, the first product. Well, I was an engineer for 10 years, so I I worked on a bunch of products early on. My, But first products, in fact, for a lot of my career were all for developers, developer tool products. Um, you know, what was the very first one? I don't know. I would have just been a junior developer, you know, a brand new developer working on. It would have been a software tool product, um, and it would have been for... Um, uh, the desktop computing workstations that were out at the time. These were Unix workstations, if you remember. And, yeah. Um, yeah. But I worked I on... Back then. <laughs> what was that? What was that? I wasn't around back then. <laughs> I was probably a bit younger. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is this is before the internet, for sure. But, yeah. um, but it was a fun time because the whole sort of personal computing industry was starting. Yeah. And did you build any products uh, before getting into like real work? And I, rem I remember, if I remember correctly, your, your first job was at HP Labs. But before that, like when you were a kid, an adolescent growing up, did you, did you build any products? Did you sell anything or have any side businesses? I mean, I worked just, I always had jobs, but they were, you know, terrible jobs at fast food restaurants and things like that. What, um, but I did learn to program when I was seven years old. And that wow. now that's a very common thing. You know, a lot of people teach their kids or the kids learn on their own. But at the time, that was very, very unusual. And it was only because I was just very lucky. My father went back to university. He was actually a, a PhD in computer science and he was a PhD student. And he taught me to program because he was spending all this time in computer labs. And so I learned to program at seven, which just to me was fun. It was just basic learning the basic programming language, but um, a lot of fun. And it gave me a very big advantage because, 
you know, I, I already, when I went to college, I wanted to study computer science, but I already had been programming for 10 years, really, just on this, uh, little bits and simple things. But still, I was thinking that way. So, yeah, that was a big advantage. It was too early, though. There weren't people back then, like, making money programming. It was just for fun. It was just for fun, yeah. Yeah, so my first product... Um was I, I grew up as an immigrant kid in Germany and my parents never had a lot of money. And um, in school, and actually after school, there was a program where we, were, we could stay there for three, four hours before, before we go home. We had uh, Monopoly, the board game. Sure. And I loved it so much, but we didn't have the money to buy it at home. So I memorized all the streets, all the values, everything. And then on a weekend at home, I built Monopoly. And because it was now my my game, I called it based on my last name. I called it Zalimoli. And I still have that. And the other day, I showed that to my kids. And they were like, wow, this is so cool. But dad, why did you memorize everything? You could have taken pictures with your iPhone. Yeah. Like, <laughs> First of all, there was no iPhone there. And second of all, if it were, we didn't have the money to buy the iPhone. So... <laughs> That, that was the first product that I built. And I had to recently think about it because I was like, well, what's actually the first product that I built? And ever since then, multiple products on the journey, but I, I never forget the first one. Now, a second question before we dive into the topic of product, what is currently your favorite product? And it doesn't have to be a technology product, but what is it? What is your favorite product as someone who spent so much time teaching product management and product leadership? Well, the truth is, I think as a product person in general, I see lots of products that I love and lots of products that I hate all the time. I mean, you just can't help it. They're everywhere. So there are a lot of very good products out there. Um, and that's sort of what keeps me going. Uh, and, and you don't even, for example, I was very critical of the early Apple Watches, but now I think the Apple Watch has got very good. That's a, turned into a very good product. Um, I continue to be so amazed at Amazon's AWS. I think that's an exceptionally good product. Um, and it's also a kind of product that I really like there. And of course, it, you can't be in the tech industry right now and not be pretty amazed at a lot of the, uh, a lot of the artificial intelligence that's actually getting out there. Uh, and the funny part was, you know, when I started, uh, what I studied in computer science was actually artificial intelligence. The problem was it was way too early, just way too early, but now it's really happening. And there's so many great examples of that out there. So there's great products and there's still horrible products everywhere. Just look at the disaster that has become Twitter. Yeah. What's your thought on that, Marty? Well, I mean, it's just very complicated and I, I'm very sad actually to see what's happened. I've, I've been on record in the past of saying that I thought Elon Musk was the greatest living product person, but not anymore. No, he's, uh, he's made a complete mess of that. And worse than that, I think he's really shown his character. So. Yeah, uh, I think the worst part of all, you wanted to talk about leadership. The worst part of all is that there are too many people in Silicon Valley that look at what he's done and think that's good. So that's probably the worst legacy of all. Yeah. I'm, I'm still curious to see how, how this whole thing turns out. Um, not sure. I, I can't judge uh, how many people are needed in order to operate Twitter. I can't judge how many needed or, or what uh, to to create this great product within Twitter. I don't know where, what Twitter should become in the future. So I'm curious to see what, what it turns out to be. The the products that I use from other Musk companies, though, Tesla and um, the from SpaceX, the, the satellite system, that's that's those are two really, really good products. But uh, yeah. let's see. Let's see what he does with Twitter. Now, moving into product. You and I've joined both of your courses around inspired and, and empowered. And in those courses, you always emphasize the four key risks of any product, right? Is it desirable? So does the customer want it? Is it usable? Can the customer actually use it in a way that is engaging and fun and the customer just loves the experience? 
Is it feasible? Which means, can we build it as an organization? Do we have the capabilities? And also, is it viable? I also remember you bringing up in one of the courses that I attended the topic of um, responsibility, or is it ethical to actually build the product? But the four main things I mentioned earlier, and recently I, I um, heard a, a podcast with you from Harry Stebbings, 20WC, and we will link this one to the show notes because I think it was fairly recent and it, it captures a lot of the topics that I don't want to get into as we don't need to have redundant content out there. But in that um, podcast, you talked about primary and secondary risk. And um, as it caught me somehow by surprise, I thought about that concept myself I wanted to use this opportunity where you and I speak to dive into this topic fairly briefly before we then go towards the topic of leadership. But what do you mean by primary versus secondary risk? And um, yeah, how do you distinguish between those two? Sure. Well, first I should, you know, there's an, there are different risk taxonomies out there. Um, you just mixed two of them together. The one I use is value, usability, feasibility, viability. Yeah. Um, you're referencing one from a little older. It came from the Stanford Design School. It's got desirability um, and feasibility and viability. But in the, and I used to use that. I've tried to use that one. The problem is for it mixes value and usability, it conflates the two. And unfortunately, what I've found is that works fine, actually, for consumer products. But for B2B products, it doesn't. Because, look, if, if you go to a B2B, there's a big difference between the buyer and the user. Yep. And neither the buyer nor user talks in terms of desirability. They are not – they don't desire a security system, right? They think that's <laughs> – They have to live with it. <laughs> they have to do it. It's not a choice. They don't desire it. Uh, so what happens because of that semantic issue, what happens is that they either they usually just look at usability. They say, look, it's easy to use. I like it. And then they don't buy it. So I don't use that taxonomy anymore. I think it's too easy for teams to miss the most important risk, which leads to your your real question. So the problem is when I talked with Harry about primary and secondary risks, most startup, we were talking about startups. That's a, a, a podcast for startups primarily. We were talking about startups and most founders gravitate towards the risk that they really are comfortable with. Hmm. And that is, you know, it depends on their background, but most of the time it's something like viability risk. Will it make money? Can we afford to build this? Which are very real risks, right? But as I was explaining to Harry, that's a secondary risk. That only makes sense if people will buy your product, right? It only makes sense if they'll buy it. Uh, otherwise, it's just academic. It's a spreadsheet, a business case that nobody cares about because it doesn't actually get bought. So the primary risk for most startups is can you create a product that people really want to buy and will buy? And then if they can, if they will buy it, then we have secondary risks we can look at that, that do matter for sure. Um, but they're only relevant once we have that core product offering. We have that core value proposition. So I try to get a lot of startups to focus on, yes, it's harder, but it's the most important thing. And that's why I emphasize the difference between value and usability risk, because value risk is really the ultimate primary risk. If that value is not there, the viability is uninteresting, sales and marketing things are uninteresting, even ethics is uninteresting because nobody cares. Yeah. Now you won't have, you won't have an impact if if customers don't adopt to your product at scale. Right. And um, in in that conversation, you also uh, talk a bit about. Uh, finding product market fit and good versus bad discovery. And what I found surprising is you mentioned, if I, if I got it right, is you need 50 to 100 attempts to get to product market fit. Can you explore on this a bit more? Because I think this is not only relevant for startups. And yes, Harry's podcast is primarily for startups. 
But when we think about organizations, larger organizations that now want to reignite innovation within them, right? Hearing that like you need 50 to 100 attempts, they are way too slow to do these 50 to 100 attempts. Yeah. But maybe and, and the on the number of, yeah. The startups are too slow too, typically. But you're right. Yeah. The same concept applies. Now, it is important to point out it's not 50 to 100 attempts for a typical feature. It's 50 yeah. to 100 attempts for to get the product market fit, which is a pretty major thing. Even whether it's a startup, it's sort of everything. And for a larger company, it's a new product line. It's taking an existing product to a new market. It's pretty, something pretty significant. And I, I share that 50 to 100 because it's usually something like that. It's not one, two, three. Uh, and that's if, if so many companies, whether it's a startup or a large company, you know, they'll spend four months for each iteration. And if an iteration takes four months, there's no way you're going to do 50. There's no way you're even going to do 20. There's just yeah. no way. You'll either run out of money or you'll run out of time or you'll run out of management patience. That's what happens at bigger companies. So they need to understand that you need to do many iterations. And then, of course, that's what product discovery is, is doing many iterations. And, of course, there's many things you can iterate on. You can iterate on the problem you're solving. You can iterate on your solution, your approach. You can iterate on, you know, the experience, you can iterate on the technology, you can iterate on the value, you can iterate on so many things. But that's what we need to do is we need to tr keep, tr we need to try and converge so that we get to something that valuable, usable, feasible, viable. Until we do that, we don't have a product. Yeah, and we don't have product market fit, right? right. Which, which is, again, the, the, the primary risk that, that you were mentioning. Now, let's focus on large organizations, not startups, because uh, I do work with some startups, but that's more like on the side and uh, just out of fun and sometimes as an angel investor. But my, my, my vast majority of work and the people that probably watch our show here work in larger organizations or work with larger organizations. Now, most large organizations and in your book, Empowered, you talk about the best and the rest. I think many organizations, especially in the geography where I'm based in Germany, wouldn't be considered as part of the best, given like the, the low number of like technology or software, or, like prime software companies that we have. And when they now have to do this 50 to 100, let's say with 50, that's even lower number, iterations to, to be able to get to product market fit for a specific product, and their cycles usually take, you mentioned four months. Sometimes it even takes longer. How do you start not only by raising the awareness, but let's say awareness is raised and they now say, let's, let's go on this journey. How do you start this journey with them to cut down significantly the time it takes for them to do every single iteration, have those faster feedback loops, learn yeah. much quicker and ultimately get to product market fit? Yeah. Well, well the truth is, it's not even hard. Um, it's just education. Um, the difference between the best and the rest is, you know, for a team, it's usually education. And one of the things I like to do in Europe is point, you know, there are great product companies in Europe. Uh, Spotify is, look at how long they have maintained their strength competing against, literally competing against Apple and Amazon, two of the best product companies in the world, um, and holding their own. But their culture is all about, in fact, it's a culture of experimentation. It's a culture of product discovery. Um, and so they, when I look, and when I first met Spotify, which was I don't know, like 15 years ago, a long time ago, but you could see they had the ingredients. They had the ingredients and their engineers, you know, this is, this is one of the easiest ways to tell. Uh, are the engineers really participating and driving or are they just there to implement code? And, and then, you know, it was very clear and it's still very clear 
that engineers play the essential role they need to. In the UK, there's an amazing company, Trainline, that has just completely disrupted the travel industry. They became the most valuable IPO in UK history last year. They're just exceptionally good, and they solve very hard problems. Again, same thing, the principles are there. So it's it's just education, really. Um, now, yes, uh, for it's not that hard to start up a company like Spotify. You know, Spotify did not transform to become a great exactly. company. They were exactly. created in that model because their founders understood. Their founders understood how good companies worked. And so they set it up that way. Now, on the other hand, Trainline did not start in that model. Trainline was an old company running terribly. And they, that basically an investor bought the company, of a, a private equity firm, bought the company and brought in new leader, new CEO, who brought in new heads of product and head of technology, and they completely turned that around. So sometimes a company is created in this fashion and sometimes they have to change, uh, but either way, they need to get to the point where they have these skills. And that's what we need to do. And I, I would argue that's what needs to happen in, um, uh, in these companies that aren't yet doing that. Now, some of them want, know that and are anxiously to, you know, working to change. Other ones don't even know what they don't know. And yeah. that's a very common problem. One of the challenges that I see a lot in Germany, and this does frustrate me because I've been going to Germany since 1999 every year. And well, on many cases, many times a year. Um, and I've seen great teams in Germany. So there, there's, it's just not evenly distributed. And the big challenge that seems to be a problem in, Indus, in Germany is, and a lot of Europe in truth, and a lot of the world, is you don't find product people in control, you find process people in control. That's what's really going on. And until the product people are able to really drive again, it's very hard for those companies to change. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important distinction um, because if you think about the, the Spotify as an example that you mentioned, Daniel Ek himself, product person, not that much of a process person. Um, Apple brought back Steve Jobs, a product person who took over from other people before him, probably some of them marketing people, some of them process people, but none of them a product person as he was. Elon Musk, you mentioned earlier, a product person. But also, they, they were all the founders. Now, how do we, and what I'm interested in is the transformations, right? Because there are so many big legacy companies. And yes, one way of looking at this could be, ultimately, they will all die and other companies will emerge. But I think the, 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 the cost of uh, these organizations dying and people having to look for new jobs, like the social costs would be immense. So identifying ways of helping them transform is something that I'm personally deep, deeply passionate about. How do we bring back that sense and that awareness that you need product people in charge? And how do we help those organizations find the right product people and how do we help those product people to then be able to lead these transformations? Because once they are in a certain role within an organization or at a certain rank within an organization, let's use this term, it's not only about building great products, they also have to build the organization because otherwise that will again be built by the process people or, or other people. How do you look at that, Marty? Well, well many questions at once. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, that's a very large topic. That's actually why I brought up the train line examples, because it was an example where um, they had to change. They were a big mm -hmm. old company and they had to change. And but and they did those things that were necessary. Now, I do try to tell everybody that truly transforming truly transform. We don't use the term transformation for a situation like a Spotify. 
because they were created in this mold, right? For But when you weren't created this way and you have to change your company, then it is. Uh, to me, that's what a transformation is. And, um, and yes, uh, the truth is most of them fail. And they fail for lots of different reasons. What we started doing, my partners and I, is start looking at the ones that succeeded and and what is it that those had in common. And they have several critical things in common that you don't, if you don't find any one of these, it can usually it usually leads to a failed effort. And you know, we've all seen those multi-million euro transformations, you bring in these big agencies, you bring in these big management consultancies, and they spend all this time and money, and they bring in all these coaches, and they bring in all these processes, and at the end of the day, they're just as bad, if not worse, than they were before. Yeah. So, so there are lots of things that are critical to get right. The biggest single thing, in my experience, is the top of the organization. When that CEO of the company just says, well, we'll just hire some management consultancy or an agency to take care of it, that's usually the sign it's gonna fail right there. Or they say, well, we'll just assign a chief digital officer or something like that. It's usually a sign. Well, we, in every one of the successful examples I know, the CEO really played an active role. They have, and, and the reason for that is not that complicated. It's because transforming a company is more than just product managers, designers, and engineers. It yeah. impacts finance, it impacts HR, it impacts marketing, sales. And if the CEO is not involved, they don't go along. They don't, they usually don't want to go along because in the, in the old model, they are in control. We call them feature team companies. They are driven by the stakeholders. But in a product company, they're not. So unless the CEO is playing an active role, it usually goes nowhere fast. And then the engine, you know, so then what happens? An IT organization just does little things like move to agile. Mm -hmm. So they move to agile all the time, but all that really means in fact, it doesn't even mean this anymore, but it used to mean that they all it does is that they're going to release frequently. Now, a lot of them are so clueless that they do a big move to Agile and they're still releasing once a quarter. And I tell them, if you're releasing once a quarter, I don't care how many coaches you have. I don't care how many rituals you have. You're not Agile. Yeah. Just not Agile. It, and it's it, not it, what you need. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually sad that over time, people are more clueless about a topic. It than- is sad, but, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> it's not that hard to see what went wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, let, let's stick to that very first top, uh, topic that you mentioned, top of the organization. This summer, I read uh, Tony Fidel's book, Built. No, I'm not sure if you if you read it. If not, I highly recommend it. Probably you know most of the stories anyway, being so close to Silicon Valley yourself. But Tony Fadell lays out the story of how important it was that the iPod team could at any point in time reach out to Steve Jobs and he would call the other teams that were impediments to that iPod, iPod team and make sure that that impediment was removed. And as the story moved, everyone knew like, oh, if we don't do what the iPod team needs us to do, we will get a call from Steve Jobs. And nobody wanted to get that call because we probably all know he could get very angry with people if they didn't do what was right for the organization. So when you talk about the CEO playing an active role in, in as part of this organization, are you referring to something similar to what Tony Fidel was describing in his in his book? Well, that's one very simple example, but there are many, many more. Uh, and the book is very good. I've been recommending that book. Oh yeah, it's up there. Yeah, it's here somewhere. Right next to the one about Amazon. Yeah, that's right. It's a terrific book, and it's um, you know he describes. And one of the things I like about the book, he talks about the best versus the rest throughout the book. And he yeah. gives examples because he always worked in hardware 
devices. So he worked on the iPod, he worked on the iPhone, he worked on the Nest devices. And, and so terrific examples and a great example. And I tell people that's one of my, it is my favorite book for CEOs to read because my writing is more at the product teams and the product leaders. His is at the CEO. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a terrific book. But that that example of him removing impediments is just a very simple example. He did much bigger things like putting engineers and designers really front and center on how you create these things, uh, doing thousands and literally thousands of prototypes. I've never been inside a company that did more prototypes than Apple. They understood the nature of product discovery. It's all about that. He's got and so putting in place a culture that works like this is the biggest thing he really did. And he, uh, he enforced that they had that culture, made no yeah. mistake about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think he did a lot of that as well at, at Pixar, if you, if you read of that course. Catmull's book about yeah. um, uh, Creativity Inc. So um, now let's, First one, CEO needs to be actively involved. CEO needs to be committed to this. CEO needs to demonstrate to everyone, hey, we are doing this and, and there's no way around it. What's the next pattern that you and your, your partners identified as part of successful transformations? The next one is you need to make sure there are two absolutely critical roles, the head of product and the head of engineering, head of technology. If those two roles, and this is a very common problem because most of those companies, they have people in those roles, but they've never done it before. Most of them have never done it before. Now, in that case, there's two options, but you got to do really one of them. And we've seen <laughs> they either have to replace those people that have been with people that have been there, done that. Or you have to provide those people coaching uh, so that they can get somebody to help them learn the first time. Mm -hmm. One way or another, because here's the thing. In the old way of working, the work way like the rest, the, the feature team model, the technology role and especially the product leader role is very, very different. So these people need a lot of help. They're going to have to build new competencies for the organization. So if that product leader does not know how to do that, if they don't know how to do a real product vision, and just to be clear, product vision, product strategy, those don't really happen in the old model. That's not how it works. So these are new skills. And also product managers. You don't even need, you don't have product managers in the feature team model. You have product owners, you don't have product managers. You have, you have a very different skill set that's required. So you need people who can develop them, recruit them, coach them. There's a lot there. And without those leaders, there's just nobody to make that happen. So it's great to have the CEO support, but if the, the heads of product and head of engineering don't know what to do, then doesn't go anywhere. Doesn't go anywhere. And I think you touched on something important. You earlier talked about one of the most important things being education. And education, it starts for me always with a certain level of awareness, but then also being able to acquire certain skills and apply those skills in your, in your daily content. And when I read Empowered, one of the things that you em emphasized a lot was that the leaders within the organization, the head of product, head of design, head of engineering, now you mentioned two of them, you, you, di you didn't mention that head of design is like crucial for the transformation piece, and I understand why, is that those people spend a significant amount of their time coaching other people, either helping them become better managers, better leaders themselves, but also coaching them and teaching them those necessary skills to do certain things, right? To be a good product manager, to be a good engineer. And for that, obviously, they had to be in those roles themselves at some point. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to teach this. Now, whenever I work with organizations, and I've had, like, especially in the past two, three years, the chance to work with several CEOs of larger organizations, and I speak to them about this aspect of leadership being teaching and coaching people. They're like, 
yeah, but I don't, I don't have the time for that. And uh, there's no CEO who, who does have the time. And then I always share this book with them, High Output Management. You've probably read this one as well from Andy Grove. And in this book, he has a chapter dedicated to why training is the boss's job. And whenever I read a, a certain segment of that chapter too, they're like, wow, he did all of that while he was the CEO of Intel? I'm like, yeah, that's at least what he's writing in his own book. And I've talked to various people at Intel. They're like, yeah, he did that. So how do you help senior leaders up to the CEO start spending more and more of their time and uh, building up the capability of teaching? Because teaching is not easy. It requires certain skills. Some people are a bit more talented than others, but in general, you have to build that skill set as well. Yes. So, um, uh, and I, um, there's some nuance here that's important though. Uh, Andy Grove was not an expert in every role in his organization. Exactly. You don't need to be an he, he was, as the CEO, he was responsible for developing his senior leadership team. But in, within those roles in the senior leadership team, they are responsible for their areas. So, for example, you mentioned, you know, I, I said the two critical roles for uh, the product side are the head of product and the head of engineering. The head of product is responsible for developing product management and product design. The head of engineering is responsible for engineering, quality assurance, runtime, DevOps, site ops. Uh, they're responsible for everything in delivering the product. So those are several skills. And I don't know any successful head of product or head of engineering that didn't come up through those organizations. It's mm -hmm. like you, you need to have that. You need to know what you're talking about. This is a common, um, a common confusion. It's a common confusion. In fact, I love that you zeroed in on how important coaching is. It really is important. However, there is a confusion out there, especially in Europe. I know, and it, but this confusion spreading to the U.S. where there's something called the, I don't, I know what I'm about to say is going to get a please, lot of Please, people. go ahead, go ahead. Don't, don't filter anything. I'm so well, looking forward to this. There's going to be people that immediately react negatively because they don't want to think through the hard problem. But um, there's something called the International Coaching Federation, which I didn't even know existed, but it is a thing. There is this group that certifies coaches. But what they mean by coaching is useful. Don't get me wrong. I think it's useful. If I could make sure everybody had that, I'd love that. But it's not it's not sufficient. It's not, it's not a foundation. They are trying to teach skills that are useful to anybody, trying to help anybody else learn anything else. However, in the real product world, <laughs> you cannot be an effective coach if you've not like done, for example, one of the most common things that people need help on is team topology. And unless you have created several team topologies and know the pros and cons, just asking people to reflect and decide, they're not, they don't know how to do it themselves. That's why they need coaching. Just like we all watched the World Cup yesterday. And um, the coaches are not just there. Uh, unfortunately, people get the idea of Ted Lasso. They're not just there. They don't, it's not, they don't have to know football. They have to know football deeply. They have to know the different skills. They have to know how to assemble a team and they have to help their people get better. That is a very different kind of coaching. It comes from a place where you have to know what you're teaching. You have to know. That is, um, there is, uh, uh, we have to make sure that people don't think they can come, because this is happening right now. People are hiring coaches and those, co and they're paying for these coaches and these coaches are not able to help them. They're able to make them feel better for a few minutes, but they're not able to help them actually solve the problems. Yeah. Now, 
Just to be clear, my favorite is if they do know how to help them and they have good people skills. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, man, <laughs> you brought up the topic. I get, I get a lot beaten up <laughs> by, by saying the stuff that you just said, but I can so relate to this because it, especially if you think about, there's, a, there's another distinction when you talk about being a coach as defined by the ICF and being a leader. Because if you're a leader in an organization, I always say you have skin in the game. A coach doesn't, right? A coach might get fired from that one assignment. So just to be clear, a real coach does have skin in the game. That's where ICF terms are all messed up. They, a real coach, just like the coach of Argentina, absolutely has yeah. skin in the game. How would you exactly. say? In fact, if they lose, he's probably fired, right? That's how exactly. that works. So I don't know where they could have possibly thought. I don't know a world where a coach, a real coach, does not have skin in the game. Yeah, but that coach, that real coach that you're referring to, like the football coach of Argentina or France, they are part of that system. They don't fly in from somewhere and ask like smart questions. Right. No, they are part of the system. They also take accountability for that system. Right. And they have a lot of passion in order to move that system forward, right? And based on that, yes, they do have skin in the game. But those coaches coming from the outside, they, they usually don't. And that's a major difference between someone that has skin in the game and someone who doesn't. Because if you do have that skin in the game, you have to act differently. And, right? and the skin in the game is one dimension, and the other dimension is knowledge of the game, real yes. knowledge of the game. And just to shine a light on this, so many agile coaches, most of them that I know, they do have some engineering experience somewhere, but they don't have product management experience and they don't have product designer experience. And so they try to coach the in product discovery and they have no idea. Yeah. No which idea. Makes it which makes it difficult. It usually is not good. <laughs> it's not yeah. gonna go well. It's not, <laughs> I agree with you on that. So we have two things now. We have top management being involved and proactively involved. We have having a good head of product, head of engineering with everything we just talked about. All those skills and capabilities are needed. If you don't have them, you either replace them or you find a coach that helps them build those capabilities. What is number three on your list of patterns of successful transformation? Number three is you really need product managers now. Uh, not product owners, not business analysts, not project managers. You need a real product manager because in a, uh, in a, once a company has transformed, they're no longer given a list of features to build. They're given problems to solve. Yeah. And when you're given problems to solve, you need to come up back to the very first thing you asked. You need to come up with solutions that are valuable, usable, feasible, and viable. And the designer knows how to make sure it's usable. And the engineers know how to make sure it's feasible. Sorry, it's, it's, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. feasible. feasible. But, but the product manager, neither of them have the context. Neither the product designer nor the engineers have the context to know viability or value. That yeah. comes from the product manager. Not from a product owner. They don't have the skills, but a product manager does. That's what they bring to the team. That they have to have deep knowledge of the customers, deep knowledge of the data, deep knowledge of how the business works, deep knowledge of the industry trends. And so, unfortunately, in so many companies, and yes, the, you know this, in Germany, the laws are very difficult. If you've got a whole bunch of people that are no longer able to do the job they need to do, it is much harder to upgrade those people. Yeah. It is much harder. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I don't think what Elon Musk has done is the right thing either, but most people are pretty reasonable about this. They have three months to get somebody to the skill level they need to do, be, but if they can't, they need to get somebody in place who can. Because product teams are only as strong as that product manager. 
Otherwise, it's a huge hole. So they need real product managers. And that is um, some, t- some of the people that are in the current roles can be trained and some of them can't. But the people who need to figure that out are those product leaders that we just talked about or a product coach that comes in to help. But one way or another, they need to make sure they have professional product managers. Yeah. So for every product in the organization, professional product managers that uh, in addition to the head of product work on the team, top- team topology and actually drive the experimentation and value delivery towards customers. Yeah, now, just what to be clear, you- the head of product and the head of engineering do the team topology. The, the to- team it. topology yes. says what the teams are, but each one of those teams needs a product manager. Yeah. And it is, uh, and I mean a real product manager, not yes. somebody just with the title. Yeah. Now, on that one thing, you mentioned each one of the teams. Do you want a product manager per team or a product manager per product where they might be working with multiple teams? No, it's always a product manager for team, per team. Okay. It's not unusual today for to have one product have a hundred product teams. Yeah. There's no way you're going to cover a hundred product teams. So no, that's clear. So, <laughs> But that's that, that's much more normal today. It's very rare that a product team has one product only and all only one pro. I mean, it's it equals the product. Very rare. That would be a very small product today. The most yeah. common ones are many teams, but they have a part of a product, a significant, meaningful part of a product. Yeah. And that would be actually, uh, I heard you talk about that as well. And I think even in, in the first conversation you and I had was about scaling via people compared to scaling via process. And you are obviously a, a, um, um, someone that is very prominent on wanting to scale via people as you value coaching and education so much and not via process. But maybe that's, that's a topic for another time, or let's see how much time we have left today. So after having those product managers in place and one great product manager per team, what is the next one? Number four on your list. Well, um, I mean, at this point, there's about probably in our view, there's about 10 critical things. Now, uh, the first three are pretty clear as far as what the priorities are. But now there's Mm -hmm. a, a broader list of things. For example, they need to learn the product discovery skills that we were Mm -hmm. talking about. They need to learn to focus on outcomes rather than outputs. outputs. Yes, as examples. They also need to establish the right relationship with the stakeholders because now they're true partners. So there's several other things that are absolutely critical. The book Empowered talks about these things, uh, but, you know, setting up an environment like we're talking about is, yeah, this is real work. This is what um, it's it's actually much harder to work like the best companies than to work like the rest. The rest just are mercenaries. They'll just build what you're told. And if it doesn't work, it's not their fault. But in a product, in a real product company, a serious product company, you, you're only as good as your outcomes. You have to deliver results. Yeah. And you have to deliver results. You need to build a group of missionaries, as you were talking about mercenaries earlier. Now, to also add a bit of, um, or maybe um, clarify this for the people that at some point want to take their organizations on this journey, let's say it's a like medium-sized company, several thousand people, not, not beyond 10,000, starting on that journey. What is the time you believe they would have to invest in this? Because many management consultancies sell this as a maximum one-year project. I've never seen it done well in that period of time. What's your experience, Marty? Yeah, well, the size matters here. Normally, when we would say medium, it would be smaller than the number you just gave. I would call that large. But um, uh, so it depends on the number. If you are, if it's a very large company, we would do this in business units. So you would do one business unit at a time. Uh, at least you would do one up front as a pilot before you spread it to the others. So when you look, there's in a, in that size company, you know, you said like a thousand or so, then 
we'd look at one is how long does it take a business unit, but more generally, how does it long does it take the whole company? So a given business unit, it, it can definitely be six to 12 months for a business unit. But for a big company, it's more like one to two years. And realistically, it's, it may never happen. If those things we talked about don't happen, not- then it doesn't happen. It just all they do is spin their wheels for a while and then they end up replacing a CEO and starting all over again. Yeah. So in, in, your, in your talks about products and also in our conversation today, you emphasize a lot on Uh, product discovery, right? Those 50 to 100 attempts to not only for single features, but especially for the product itself. When I look at organizational development and organizational design, I try to apply a lot of the same principles that we apply in product development. Why? Because I believe if we want to move from one state of the organization, 1.0, to let's say 2.0, there is a lot of uncertainty involved as well. And how we deal with uncertainty is frequent experimentation. So we systematically want to reduce that uncertainty. Uh, A few weeks ago, I was talking to Joachim Sunden, and probably you met him. He was one of the early coaches at Spotify. Mm -hmm. And even at Spotify, where this was all built like from, from scratch, and they didn't have to make a transformation, as you mentioned, they did a lot of experimentation. Now, how do you look at dealing with uncertainty when it comes to organizational design and transformation? Yeah, you have a yeah, you you heard me. I didn't elaborate, but I I, uh, a little name dropped in there. I mentioned when you're working in a big company, we like to do a smaller unit first. That's what we call a pilot. And the purpose of a pilot is to be able to quickly and easily do this experimentation and figure out what works well in this culture, in this company, with these people, with this product, with this CEO. You don't want to do that to an entire multi-thousand person company. You want to do that when it's small and easy. And then once you've, and there's other benefits too, by the way. First of all, the, the main reason we do this is what you just brought up, the need to experiment quickly. But there is another big reason And that is um, in every company that has large numbers of people, you have what's referred to as the technology adoption curve. You have some employees that love change and some employees that hate change. And most employees just want to see it working before they change anything. So that is going on. And one of the worst things you can do is just apply the change across the company in one shot. And so what we'd rather do is pilots, pilot teams, much easier. So usually we say one, two, maybe three pilot product teams. That's when I say product team, I mean a cross-functional product team. So product manager, designer, and some number of engineers. And they are a unit. You want to have one, two, maybe three of those. They should be in the same business unit, and they are the pilot for the organization. And everybody's watching them learn and experiment. And some things go well, some things don't go well, and they iterate, but they will do a bunch of iterations until the company more broadly can look at them and say, yeah, we should work that way. That clearly does work here. It works for us. We've worked out the differences. We're ready. Yeah. And I think that's very important, as you mentioned. I always emphasize with our clients, you need to build your internal case studies because those that are hesitant of change, they don't care whether it's worked at Spotify or ING or whatever, right? When I work with, uh, for example, MAN, which is a subsidiary, or it was from Volkswagen building trucks, they're like, yeah, it's nice that you can do this in a, in a music company. We built hardware, right? Yeah. Or when you work with pharma or med tech companies, they're like, yeah, it's nice if a bank can do does do that. We are highly regulated, right? We can't get patients in for feedback cycles and all of that. So building those internal case studies is key. Now, after those pilots, and maybe this is the time to get into the question of scaling by a people versus scaling by a process. Because what I imagine, and I'm I'm fully on board of what I read and empowered and 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 the talks that I've seen from you, but I I believe based on everything that I've seen that this can be very time consuming because if we want to, and I don't mean this badly at all, right? 
But if you want to scale via people, this also means we scale via teaching people certain capabilities. And depending on what those capabilities are, it can take a lot of time to learn them and even more time to then be a master of applying those capabilities within your context so that you can scale. And it's not like one or two product managers. You mentioned there are products with hundreds of product managers. Mm -hmm. Then you also have to teach the engineers. You have to teach the designers. Every single one of them needs to become better at doing this work, being part of an empowered product team. How do you look at that? How does SVPG, but also other organizations that you that you rely on, how do they do that when they work with larger organizations? Right. Well, I mean that one way or another, the people have to learn what to do. The the two fundamental ways are you give people a playbook, a process that says this is what you do, and those processes are usually created as a way to avoid people making mistakes. Right. They mistakes have may have been made in the past. So you just follow these steps uh, or the leaders coach. Um, and we you you may have seen like in empowered. We say if you're a first, this is where it's different from an Andy Grove level of a C-suite. They, you know, Andy Grove didn't spend 80% of his time coaching his leadership team. He spent a little bit of his time coaching his leadership team. But those managers that were first level managers, those people that manage individual contributors, that is where the real coaching happens. That's where mm -hmm. the vast majority of the coaching goes on. We tell people that if you're a first level manager, in other words, you manage product managers, designers, or engineers, you need to be spending roughly 80% of your time on coaching and staffing. Think about that. That's four days a week on coaching and staffing. If you've done a lot, if you have a lot of openings, you know that staffing takes a whole lot of time. You also know that staffing is very related to coaching. The better job you do on staffing, the easier coaching is. But coaching is always a thing. Um, Recently, there's been several articles that have come out talking about uh, something I've been sharing for a while. Google has done a lot of research on what makes the best teams. And one of the things they did recently was what makes the best manager. And so they did a bunch of research on what are the traits. The number one trait of a successful manager at Google is they are considered a good coach by their people. That's the number one trait, being a good coach. Interestingly, the number two trait is that they are considered an empowering manager, not a micromanager. So they're yeah. very related. But that's right. They're, and that's none of that was a surprise. That is very much the model they were created under. That is how you scale, is you coach and develop. Now, you can argue which one takes more time, which one takes less time. I mean, to me, they're not even, they're not even apples to apples because you're developing leaders when you're coaching. You're developing robots when you're giving them pro process. That's why yeah, Elon really. Musk likes to say the problem at big companies is that process becomes a substitute for thinking. Yes. And I really think that's true. That's the problem. We want people to think. Yeah, we don't. We don't want what Henry Ford mentioned hundred years ago. It's a pity that if you want a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached. <laughs> we actually want. We actually want that that brain to do the thinking. Now, this eighty percent, Marty. When you first talk to leaders and organizations, even like the first level leaders. And they reflect on what you just said, and they look at their calendars. They are nowhere near that 80%. That's right. It's usually right. not even in the top three. Uh, coaching exactly. is usually not in the top three. So this is, remember, though, these are people who are trying to transform. And yes. So I tell them their job is now very different. And this is a very easy way for them to see how different it is. Now, the next question often is, well, how do I coach them if I don't know how to do it myself, right? 
And that's where the coaching, you know, product leadership coaching comes in. And also, uh, this is where their managers have to make sure that they are putting in place, they are developing their leaders. Yeah. So that would be probably then the tough conversation if they really don't know how to develop those people because they don't know how to do the work themselves, that they're probably not the right person for that job. Uh, unfortunately, very true, very common. Yeah, and then they probably have to look for something else. So Marty, given um, the time we had scheduled for this, I uh, want to use this opportunity again to thank you so much for making time for this. For me, it was absolutely like learning a ton of new things. Um, we will produce this video as, as quickly as we can and put it out there so that other people can also benefit from, from your large, uh, many years of experience, your wisdom, your knowledge that you've written down and shared so graciously in your books. And I'm hopeful that at some point again, maybe next year, I'll get you for another conversation. I always have questions for you. So <laughs> don't worry about that. All right. Well, my pleasure. Hope it was useful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marty. Thank you.